Heinrich Muller, the 28th of April 1900, date of death unknown, but evidence points to May 1945, was a high-ranking German Schutzstaffel, SS, and police official during the Nazi era. For the majority of World War II in Europe, he was the chief of the Gestapo, the secret state police of Nazi Germany. Muller was central in the planning and execution of the Holocaust and attended the January 1942 ONC conference, which formalized plans for deportation and genocide of all Jews in German-occupied Europe, the final solution to the Jewish question. He was known as Gestapo Muller to distinguish him from another SS general named Heinrich Muller. He was last seen in the Führer bunker in Berlin on the 1st of May 1945 and remains the most senior figure of the Nazi regime who is never captured or confirmed to have died. Early life and career Muller was born in Munich on the 28th of April 1900 to Catholic parents. His father had been a rural police official. Muller attended a Volkschule and completed an apprenticeship as an aircraft mechanic before the outbreak of the First World War. During the last year of the war, he served in the Luftstreitkraft as a pilot for an artillery spotting unit. He was decorated several times for bravery, including the Iron Cross First and Second Class, Bavarian Military Merit Cross Second Class with Swords and Bavarian Pilot's Badge. After the war ended, he joined the Bavarian police in 1919 as an auxiliary worker. Although not a member of the Freikorps, he was involved in the suppression of the communist risings in the early post-war years. After witnessing the shooting of hostages by the revolutionary Red Army in Munich during the Bavarian Soviet Republic, he acquired a lifelong hatred of communism. During the years of the Weimar Republic, he was head of the Munich Political Police Department, having risen quickly through the ranks due to his spirited efforts. SS career It was under these auspices that he became acquainted with many members of the Nazi Party, NSDAP, including Heinrich Himmler and Reinhard Heydrich, although Muller in the Weimar period was generally seen as a supporter of the Bavarian People's Party, which at that time ruled Bavaria. On the 9th of March 1933, during the Nazi putsch that deposed the Bavarian government of Minister-President Heinrich Held, Muller advocated to his superiors using force against the Nazis. Ironically, these views aided Muller's rise as it guaranteed the hostility of the Nazis, thereby making Muller very dependent upon the patronage of Reinhard Heydrich, who in turn appreciated Muller's professionalism and skill as a policeman, and was aware of Muller's past. Once the Nazis seized power, Muller's knowledge of communist activities placed him in high demand. As a result, he was promoted to Polizei Obersekretär in May 1933 and again to criminal inspector in November 1933. Historian Richard J. Evans wrote Muller was a stickler for duty and discipline, and approached the tasks he was set as if they were military commands. A true workaholic who never took a vacation. Muller was determined to serve the German state, irrespective of what political form it took, and believed it was everyone's duty, including his own, to obey its dictates without question. Evans also records Muller was a regime functionary out of ambition, not out of a belief in National Socialism. An internal Nazi party memorandum could not understand how so odious an opponent of the movement could become head of the Gestapo, especially since he had once referred to Hitler as an immigrant unemployed house painter and an Austrian draft dodger. Nazi jurist and former police chief SS Obergruppenführer Werner Bestopine Muller represented one of the finest examples of the limited connection between members of the NSDAP and the police before 1933. After the Nazis came to power in 1933, Heydrich, as head of the security service SD, recruited Muller. Franz Joseph Huber and Joseph Albert Maysinger, who were collectively referred to as the Bajaran Brigade, Bavarian Brigade. Muller joined the SS in 1934. By 1936, with Heydrich head of the Gestapo, Muller was its operations chief. On the 4th of January 1937, an evaluation by the Nazi Party's deputy Gauleiter of Munich Upper Bavaria stated, Criminal Police Chief Inspector Heinrich Muller is not a party member.
He has also never actively worked within the party or in one of its ancillary organizations. Before the seizure of power Muller was employed in the political department of the police headquarters. He did his duty both under the direction of the notorious police president Koch, Julius Koch, the Munich police president 1929-33, and under Nortz and Mantle. His sphere of activity was to supervise and deal with the left-wing movement, H.E. fought against it very hard, sometimes in fact ignoring legal provisions and regulations, but it is equally clear that Muller would have acted against the right in just the same way. With his enormous ambition and his marked pushiness he would win the approval of his superiors. In terms of his political opinions, his standpoint varied between the German National People's Party and the Bavarian People's Party. But he was by no means a National Socialist. As far as his qualities of character are concerned, these are regarded in an even poorer light than his political ones. He is ruthless and continually tries to demonstrate his efficiency, but claims all the glory for himself. In his choice of officials for the Bavarian political police he was very concerned to propose either officials who were more junior than himself or only those who were inferior in ability, in this way he could keep rivals at bay. In his choice of officials he did not take account of political considerations, he only had his own egoistical aims in mind. The Gau leadership of Munich Upper Bavaria cannot, therefore, recommend accelerated promotion for Muller because he has rendered no services to the national uprising. This assessment did not deter Heydrich from moving Muller along the ranks, particularly since Heydrich believed it was an advantage not to be bound to the influence of the Nazi party. Functionaries like Muller were the sort of men Heydrich preferred since they were inherently committed to their area of responsibility and correspondingly justified any steps they deemed necessary against perceived enemies of the Nazi racial community. Muller was promoted to the rank of standard and for colonel in 1937. Engrossing himself often in red tape and statistics, Muller was a natural administrator who took solace in a world of notes, memos, and regulations and then received and transformed Gestapo reports of denouncements, torture, and secret executions into administrative fodder. Despite the expense of so much mental energy in carrying out his duties, Muller disliked the scholarly types and once told Walter Schellenberg that intellectuals should be sent down a coal mine and blown up. British author and translator Edward Crankshaw described Muller as the archetype non-political functionary who was in love with personal power and dedicated to the service of authority, the state. General Walter Dornberger, the chief over the rocket research at Peenemund, under alleged Gestapo suspicion was one of the few to ever interview with Muller and characterize him as the unobtrusive type of police official who leaves no personal impression on the memory but added, all I could remember was a pair of piercing grey-blue eyes, fixed on me with an unwavering scrutiny. My first impression was one of cold curiosity and extreme reserve. American journalist and war correspondent, William L. Shirer, called Muller a, a dapper-looking fellow but shortly thereafter described him as a cold, dispassionate killer. H-I-M-M-L-E-R biographer Peter Padfield wrote, He was an archetypal middle-rank official. Of limited imagination, non-political, non-ideological, his only fanaticism lay in an inner drive to perfection in his profession and in his duty to the state, which in his mind were one. A smallish man with piercing eyes and thin lips, he was an able organizer, utterly ruthless, a man who lived for his work. Such was his dedication to the job that Auschwitz Commandant Rudolf Haas claimed one could reach Muller any time of the day or night, even Sundays and public holidays. He was made inspector of the security police for all of Austria following the 1938 Anschluss, while his close friend Franz Joseph Huber took charge of the Gestapo office in Vienna. One of Muller's first major acts occurred during the unprecedented Kristallnacht pogrom of 9 10 November 1938, 
when he ordered the arrest of between 20,000 to 30,000 Jews. Heydrich also tasked Muller during the summer of 1939 to create a centrally organized agency to deal with the eventual emigration of the Jews. Muller became a member of the Nazi party in 1939 for the purely opportunist reason of improving his chances of promotion and only after Himmler insisted he do it. Historian Robert Gellately does not give much credence to this apolitical image of Muller and cites the musings of Walter Schellenberg, who claimed during a conversation with Muller sometime in 1943, Muller lauded the Stalinist system as superior to Nazism, which he believed compromised on too much. Schellenberg even alleged when Muller compared Stalin against Hitler, his, Muller's, opinion was Stalin did things better. As Gellately relates, such a politically oriented asseveration certainly indicates Muller did indeed have preferences. He was notorious, for instance, for admiring the Soviet police. While the chief of the subsequent Reich Central Office for Jewish emigration was indeed Heydrich, it was Muller who took care of the office's administrative details. Shortly thereafter, Muller took charge of this office but then handed control over to Adolf Eichmann. Once the war began, this ended the possibility of Jewish emigration and caused the office's dissolution. Gestapo Chief In September 1939, when the Gestapo and other police organizations were consolidated under Heydrich into the Reich Main Security Office, RSHA, Muller was made chief of the RSHA, and the fourth, office or department for, Gestapo. To distinguish him from another SS general named Heinrich Muller, he became known as Gestapo Muller. As Gestapo Chief of Operations and later, September 1939 forward head of the organization, Muller played a leading role in the detection and suppression of all forms of resistance to the Nazi regime. Trusted by both Heydrich and Himmler, Muller was pivotal in making the Gestapo the central executive organ of National Socialist Terror, according to historians Karsten Dams and Michael Stahl. Under his leadership, the Gestapo succeeded in infiltrating and to a large extent, destroying groups opposed to the Nazis, such as the underground networks of the left-wing Social Democratic Party and Communist Party. Along these lines, historian George C. Browder asserts that Muller's expertise and his ardent hate for communism guaranteed his future. When Hitler and his army chiefs asked for a pretext for the invasion of Poland in 1939, Himmler, Heydrich, and Muller masterminded and carried out a false flag project codenamed Operation Himmler. During one of the operations, the clandestine mission to a German radio station on the Polish border, Muller helped collect a dozen or so condemned men from camps, who were then dressed in Polish uniforms. In exchange for their participation, the men were told by Muller that they would be pardoned and released. Instead, the men were given a lethal injection and gunshot wounds to make them appear to have been killed in action during a fake attack. These incidents, particularly the staged attack on the Gliwitz radio station, were then used in Nazi propaganda to justify the invasion of Poland, the opening event of World War II. Thereafter, Muller continued to rise quickly through the ranks of the SS. In October 1939, he became an SS Oberführer. In November 1941, Gruppenführer and Lieutenant General of the Police. During the Second World War, Muller was heavily involved in espionage and counter-espionage, particularly since the Nazi regime increasingly distrusted the military intelligence service. The Abwehr, which under Admiral Wilhelm Canaris was a hotbed of activity for the German resistance. In 1942 he successfully infiltrated the Red Orchestra network of Soviet spies and used it to feed false information to the Soviet intelligence services. Heydrich was Muller's direct superior until his assassination in 1942. For the remainder of the war, Ernst Kaltenbrunner took over as Muller's superior. Muller occupied a position in the Nazi hierarchy close to Himmler, the overall head of the Nazi police apparatus and the chief architect of the plan to exterminate the Jews of Europe, and Ekman, the man entrusted with arranging the deportations of Jews to the eastern ghettos and death camps. Eichmann headed the Gestapo's Office of Resettlement, 
and then its Office of Jewish Affairs, the RSHAM, the fourth subsection known as Referat, the fourth B4. He was Muller's subordinate. Muller was also involved in the regime's policy towards the Jews, although Himmler and propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels drove this area of policy. On the 6th of October 1939, for instance, Muller instructed Eichmann to prepare for the deportation of some 70,000 to 80,000 Jews from the annexed Polish city of Katowice, an order which included the deportation of the Jews from Ostrava. Both expulsion campaigns had already been planned as early as September by the Gestapo or the army. Twelve days later on the 18th of October 1939, he told Eichmann it would soon be necessary to organize the resettlement and removal of Poles and Jews into the area of the future Polish rump state centrally via the Arshad. Although his chief responsibility was always police work within Germany, he was fully in charge and thus responsible to execute the extermination of the Jews of Europe. When Eichmann reported to Muller sometime in the middle of 1941 that he had been formed by Himmler, the Führer had ordered the physical destruction of the Jews for instance, Muller silently nodded at his desk, indicating to Eichmann that he already knew. Correspondingly, Muller received detailed reports from Eichmann about the Einsatzgruppen and death squad units, which according to historian Raoul Hilber killed more than 2 million people, including 1.3 million Jews between 1941 and 1945. At the end of June 1941, Muller dispatched Eichmann to Minsk, so he could collect detailed information on the execution activities. In August 1941, Muller ordered these killing reports be forwarded to Hitler. Attempting to keep the brutality of the wholesale slaughter occurring in the East as quiet as possible, Muller sent a telegram to the Einsatzgruppen towards the end of August 1941, which explicitly instructed them to prevent the crowding of spectators during the mass executions. On the 23rd of October 1941, Muller briefed a circular to SIPO stations which exclusively prohibited any future Jewish emigration out of German-controlled territory, a directive which presaged their imminent extermination. In January 1942, he attended the Wannsee Conference at which Heydrich briefed senior officials from a number of government departments of the extermination plan, and at which Eichmann took the minutes. Once the conference concluded, Muller, Heydrich, and Eichmann remained afterwards for additional, informal chats. Just a couple months later in March 1942, Jews were already being systematically killed in gas vans at Chelno and Belzac while construction was underway at Birkenau and Sobibur. Again, Muller sent Eichmann to relate his findings about the killing operations taking place at Chelno. When Eichmann returned this time, he reported to Muller that the scene was horrible and added it was an indescribable inferno. When the first denunciations of the mass murder being carried out by the Germans hit the Allied press during the autumn and winter of 1942, Himmler instructed Muller to ensure all the bodies were either buried or burned. Enforcement and administration of Nazi racial hygiene policies were also within the purview of Muller's responsibilities, as a special letter he sent from Berlin to all Gestapo offices on the 10th of March 1942 reveals, the letter contained instructions concerning the relationship between German women and Polish civilians or prisoners of war who were conscripted as labor during the war, particularly in cases related to pregnancy. If both parties proved racially acceptable and the Polish man wanted to marry the woman, the pregnancy and relationship was allowed without punitive consequences, provided the RSHA approved after photographic evaluation of both parties and subsequent Germanization of the Pole occurred. For cases where one or more parties was deemed racially unfit, the Polish male would receive special handling, an obvious Nazi euphemism for a Death dash sentence. In May 1942, Heydrich was assassinated in Prague by Czech soldiers sent from London. Muller was sent to Prague to head the investigation into Operation Anthropoid. He succeeded through a combination of bribery and torture in locating the assassins, who killed themselves to avoid capture. Despite this success, his influence within the regime declined somewhat with the loss of his original patron, Heydrich. Nonetheless, 
Between the time Heydrich died in 1942 and Kaltenbrunner took office in January 1943, Muller played a central role in the organization of the Holocaust. Evidence of Muller's intimate involvement in the Holocaust are abundant in some of the surviving documents and in the later testimony of Eichmann, who divulged that he remained in constant contact with Muller. Eichmann recalled how Muller reserved power unto himself and while he, Eichmann, arranged plenty of deportations, it was only Muller who could write the total number of Jews in his orange-colored pencil who were transported at the top of the corresponding reports. As the Red Army counter-offensive against the Germans raid at the Battle of Stalingrad in mid-November 1942 started to take its toll, the exigencies of war demanded an increase in arms production. Muller played his part by responding to and facilitating Himmler's request for an additional 35,000 to 40,000 forced laborers. The Gestapo chief rounded them up from across detention centers and prisons which were not yet part of the concentration camp system and sent them to Medanek and Auschwitz. Sometime in 1943, Muller was sent to Rome to pressure fascist Italy to cooperate in relinquishing their Jews for deportation. Despite having the apparent support of Benito Mussolini, Muller's efforts were not very successful as influential Jewish figures within Italy were in contact with the police and the military. They successfully appealed to their Italians and Jews shared religious convictions and convinced them to resist Nazi pressure. In 1943 Muller had differences with Himmler over what to do with the growing evidence of a resistance network within the German state apparatus, particularly the Abwehr and the Foreign Office. He presented Himmler with firm evidence during February 1943 that Wilhelm Canaris was involved with the resistance. However, Himmler told him to drop the case. Offended by this, Muller became an ally of Martin Bormann, the head of the Nazi Party Chancellery, who was Himmler's main rival. According to the CPO and SD official in Denmark, Rudolf Mildner, Gestapo chief Muller instructed him to arrest the Nobel Prize winning atomic physicist Niels Bohr sometime during the fall of 1943. This was likely the consequence of Bohr being half Jewish, but his scientific significance also interested officials in Berlin. Fortunately for Bohr, he was tipped off by a sympathetic German woman working for the Gestapo and was able to escape across the Kattegat Strait into Sweden with the evacuation of Jews from Denmark. Later, Mildner conveniently asserted during Allied questioning that he had disobeyed Muller's order and allowed Bohr to get to safety. Early in 1944, Muller issued the Nazi injunction known as the Cartridge Directive. This command ordered that Soviet prisoners of war who had assisted in the identification of detained political commissars for the purpose of their liquidation be executed on the grounds they were Geheim Nistrager, bearers of secrets. Instructions like these amid the numerous other crimes committed at his command made Muller one of the most feared officials in Europe during the Nazi reign. After the assassination attempt against Adolf Hitler on the 20th of July 1944, Muller was placed in charge of the arrest and interrogation of all those suspected of involvement in the resistance. Over 5,000 people were arrested and about 200 executed, including Canaris. Not long after the anti-Nazi resistors were sadistically killed, Muller allegedly exclaimed, We won't make the same mistake as in 1918. We won't leave our internal German enemies alive. In the last months of the war, Muller remained at his post, apparently still confident of a German victory. He told one of his officers in December 1944 the Ardennes offensive would result in the recapture of Paris. Berlin 1945 In April 1945, he was among the last group of Nazi loyalists assembled in the Führer bunker in central Berlin as the Red Army fought its way into the city in the Battle of Berlin. One of his last tasks was the sharp interrogation of Hermann Fegelein in the cellar of the Church of the Trinity as to what he knew of Himmler's attempted peace negotiations with the Western Allies behind Hitler's back. Fegelein was Himmler's SS liaison officer and was shot after Hitler had Himmler expelled from all his posts for the betrayal. Hitler's secretary, Trau Adel Junge, recounted seeing Muller on the 22nd of April 1945 and claimed she saw him on occasion chatting with Hitler in the bunker 
She also added that he, Muller, had assumed Carl Tenbrunner's former duties as head of the RSHA. Both Young and Oberscharfuhrer Rockhusmisch, the telephone operator for the Führer bunker, recalled seeing Muller on the 30th of April 1945. Misch placed him in the Reich Chancellery still in full uniform. That afternoon, Hitler committed suicide. On the 2nd of May 1945, the commander of the Berlin Defense Area, General Helmut Weidling, surrendered to the Red Army. Disappearance Muller was last seen in the bunker on the evening of the 1st of May 1945, the day after Hitler's suicide. Hans Bauer, Hitler's pilot, later quoted Muller as saying, We know the Russian methods exactly. I haven't the faintest intention of being taken prisoner by the Russians. From that day onwards, no trace of him has ever been found. He is the most senior member of the Nazi regime whose fate remains a mystery. However, the best evidence points to him either having been killed or committing suicide during the chaos of the fall of Berlin, and his body, if recovered, was not identified at the Central Intelligence Agency's CIA file on Mueller was released under the Freedom of Information Act in 2001, and documents several unsuccessful attempts by U.S. agencies to find Mueller. The U.S. National Archives commentary on the file concludes, Though inconclusive on Mueller's ultimate fate, the file is very clear on one point. The Central Intelligence Agency and its predecessors did not know Mueller's whereabouts at any point after the war. In other words, the CIA was never in contact with Mueller. The CIA file shows an extensive search was made for Mueller in the months after the German surrender. The search was led by the counter-espionage branch of the U.S. Office of Strategic Services, forerunner of the CIA. The search was complicated by the fact that Heinrich Muller is a very common German name. A further problem arose because some of these Mullers, including Gestapo Muller, did not appear to have middle names. An additional source of confusion was that there were two different SS generals named Heinrich Muller. In 1947, American and British agents searched the home of his wartime mistress Anna Schmidt, but found nothing suggesting that he was still alive. With the onset of the Cold War and the shift of priorities to meeting the challenge of the Soviet Union, interest in pursuing missing Nazis declined. By this time, the conclusion seems to have been reached that Muller was most likely dead. The Royal Air Force Special Investigation Branch also had an interest in Muller with regard to the Stalag Luft, the third murders, for which he was presumed to have responsibility given his position in the Gestapo. Walter Schellenberg alleged in his memoir that Muller had defected to the Soviets in 1945. Schellenberg also wrote that a German officer, who had been a prisoner of war in Russia, claimed to have seen Muller in Moscow in 1948, and that he had died shortly afterward. There is no reference in the memoir as to who the German officer was or any other details that might help verify this claim. The seizure in 1960 and subsequent trial in Israel of Adolf Eichmann sparked new interest in Muller's whereabouts. Although Eichmann revealed no specific information, he told his Israeli interrogators that he believed that Muller was still alive. The West German office in charge of the prosecution of war criminals charged the police to investigate. The possibility that Muller was working for the Soviet Union was considered, but no definite information was gained. Muller's family and his former secretary were placed under surveillance by the Allies in case he was corresponding with them. The West Germans investigated several reports of Muller's body being found and buried in the days after the fall of Berlin. The reports were contradictory, not wholly reliable and it was not possible to confirm any of them. One such report came from Walter Luthers, a former member of the Volksturm, who said he had been part of a burial unit which had found the body of an SS general in the Garden of the Reich Chancellery, with the identity papers of Heinrich Muller. The body had been buried in a mass grave at the old Jewish cemetery on Gross Hamburger Strasse in the Soviet sector. Since this location was in East Berlin in 1961, this gravesite could not at the time be investigated by West Germany, 
nor has there been any attempt to excavate this grave site since the reunification of Germany. In 1961, Lieutenant Colonel Michael Gerlinuski, the Deputy Chief of Polish Military Counterintelligence, defected to the United States. Gerlinuski had worked as an interrogator of captured German officials from 1948 to 1952. He never met Muller but said he had heard from his Soviet supervisors that sometime between 1950 and 1952, the Soviets had picked up Muller and taken him to Moscow. The CIA tried to track down the man Yelenewski named as having worked with Muller in Moscow, but were unable to confirm his story. Israel also continued to pursue Muller. In 1967, two Israeli operatives were caught by West German police attempting to break into the Munich apartment of Muller's wife. In 1967, in Panama City, a man named Francis Willard Keith was accused of being Muller. West German diplomats pressed Panama to extradite him for trial. West German prosecutors said Sophie Muller, 64, had seen photos of Keith and identified him as her long missing husband. However, Keith was released once fingerprints proved he was not Muller. The CIA investigation concluded, there is little room for doubt that the Soviet and Czechoslovak intelligence services circulated rumors to the effect that Muller had escaped to the West to offset the charges that the Soviets had sheltered the criminal. There are strong indications but no proof that Muller collaborated with the Soviets. There are also strong indications but no proof that Muller died in Berlin. The CIA apparently remained convinced at that time that if Muller had survived the war, he was being harbored within the Soviet Union. But when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991 and the Soviet archives were opened, no evidence to support this belief emerged. The U.S. National Archives commentary concludes, More information about Mueller's fate might still emerge from still-secret files of the former Soviet Union. The CIA file, by itself, does not permit definitive conclusions. Taking into account the currently available records, the authors of this report conclude that Mueller most likely died in Berlin in early May 1945. By the 1990s, it was in any case increasingly unlikely Muller, who was born in 1900, would be alive even if he had survived the war. In 2008, historian Peter Longerick published a biography of Heinrich Himmler, translated into English in 2012, that contained an alleged first-hand account of Muller's last known whereabouts. According to reports from Himmler's adjutant Werner Grothmann, Muller was with Himmler at Flinsburg on the 11th of May and accompanied Himmler and other SS officers as they attempted to escape the Allies on foot. Himmler and Muller parted company at Mindset, after which Muller was not seen again. In 2013, Johannes Tuckel, the head of the memorial to the German resistance, claimed Muller's body was found in August 1945 by a work crew cleaning up corpses and was one of 3,000 buried in a mass grave on the site of a former Jewish cemetery in Berlin Mitt. While Tuckel was confident he had solved the mystery, whether Muller is actually there has not been confirmed. Nonetheless, the uncertainty of Muller's ultimate end and or whereabouts has only served to nourish the mysterious power that the Gestapo elicits even to the present. Falsified Muller CIC dossier in July 1988 author Ian Sayer received, from an anonymous individual, a 427-page photocopied U.S. Army Counterintelligence Corps CIC file claimed it had been inadvertently released by the U.S. National Archives. The dossier purported to confirm Heinrich Muller had survived the war and been retained by the CIC as an intelligence advisor. Sayer and co-author Douglas Botting were known to be working on a comprehensive history of the U.S. Army's Counterintelligence Corps (CIC) at that time. The alleged dossier had also come to the attention of the U.S. Department of Justice's Nazi Hunting Unit, the Office of Special Investigations who subsequently sought Sayer's opinion on the veracity of the documents. By this time, the anonymous individual, later identified as Gregory Douglas, had managed to interest Time magazine and the London Times newspaper in his story. However, the dossier claims and associated materials were found to be fictitious.
See also Glossary of Nazi Germany List of Nazi Party Leaders and Officials List of Fugitives from Justice Who Disappeared List of SS Personnel References Informational Notes Citations Bibliography External links Nazi war crimes and Japanese Imperial Government records interagency working group, RG 263 detailed report, Heinrich Müller quotations related to Heinrich Müller at wiki quote media related to Heinrich Müller Gestapo at Wikimedia Commons.